Hello, I'm Peter Houston, the Archivist and Special Collections Librarian, and uh, this is a short video lecture about early printed works at the Mount Royal University Archives and Special Collections. We have a number of early printed uh, books and sort of fragments of books um, from the, the sort of late 15th and early uh, 16th centuries, and so we're going to take a look at some of those, and we're also going to, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the impact that the printing revolution, you know, the printing press, had on uh, European sort of culture and society uh, during the Renaissance. Okay, so I think we should start by going back in time a little bit uh, to, we're going to look at the medieval period. So during the medieval period, before the printing press was invented, um, all books had to be written out by hand by, by people like this. This is a, a nice illustration from a 16th century uh, Latin Bible that shows a scribe at work. And you can see uh, yeah, if you wanted a, a text copied, it would have to be done um, entirely by hand, uh, laboriously, and it would take quite a bit of time. Um, and, you, and so you can expect that the cost of producing a book in the medieval period, you know, was it was quite expensive. Um, not just the time involved, but also the materials. Now, things changed with the printing revolution. So uh, just a little bit of background, um, you know, we've all heard of Johannes Gutenberg and his famous Gutenberg Bible, the first sort of printed book. Um, that was uh, printed in 1455, and that he he kind of took some existing technologies, combined them with some of his own inventions, the printing press, an easy and an easy way to um, cast metal type, movable movable metal type, and and he basically developed this really sort of robust and easily kind of replicable uh, printing system that within a few decades of him printing that that famous Bible had spread throughout Europe. And soon there were print shops, you know, in Italy and in places as far flung as England um, and Eastern Europe uh, that were that were starting to print books and other types of texts, you know, pamphlets, broadsides, that sort of thing. Um, I want to briefly kind of go over the process. I think it'll give you a bit of an appreciation for you know for the work that went into producing some of the leaves that you're going to see. Um, so what you can see here is a print workshop. The technology. This this illustration is from as you can see the 1560s. Um, but uh, it basically shows what it would have been like, you know, a hundred years earlier. Um, you have at the back, there's uh, sitting by the big windows for, for the light coming through them are two uh, typesetters at work. So what they have is, um, you know, to print a page, you would have to find uh, every letter, there would be a separate piece of metal type that you'd have to pull off of the, that are all set into that table there and they're putting them into a form. Um, which is kind of your, when it's finished, forms your kind of a uh, printing plate. Uh, once all that type had been arranged in the right order, which would take a long time in itself, it would be brought up to the, the two men at the front of the, this image. Uh, you can see the one has two kind of paddles in his hand. Those, uh, he's applying ink to the printing plate. Uh, so uh, doing an even layer of ink. And then after that was done, he would put a sheet of blank paper, or in the early days they, they would use parchment sometimes too, uh, made from animal skin, on top of that inked up plate, slide it into the printing press, the big machine you see beside him um, on the right, and then crank it down with the, the, the handle that you see, which would apply a sort of even pressure to make all that ink that's, that's on the, you know, on the um, type in that printing plate, uh, make all that ink come off cleanly onto the sheet. The other man is, is actually taking off that newly printed uh, sheet, and then they could re-ink that, that um, the printing plate and do the whole thing again. Now, you can see still a very uh, time and sort of labor-intensive process, a lot of people involved in it, but compared to uh, manuscript production, they could print off a huge number of copies in a fraction of the time that it would take scribes to actually sort of write them out by hand. Especially once you have that, that printing plate, you know, set up, um, you could quickly rattle off hundreds or thousands of copies in, in yeah, a relatively short period of time, making uh, the production of books much, much faster. And, and therefore the product, the end product, you know, books and other printed texts became much cheaper and much uh, sort of more available to, to kind of, to read and to own. Um, you know, it had been a pretty exclusive thing to actually own a book in the medieval period. With, with printing technology, the cost came down, and so a greater swath of, of society could own these things, leading to a sort of a rise in literacy, um, which had all sorts of explosive effects on society and, and culture uh, in the early modern period. Um, <clears throat> 
One thing this did is it really supercharged uh, the sort of sharing of ideas, knowledge dissemination, um, because you could easily, you know, print off uh, a cheap little pamphlet containing your ideas and sort of share it with the world um, by distributing it uh, in a way that you couldn't do, again, when you're relying on scribes writing it out. And this really contributed to a lot of the, the big sort of movements that gripped uh, Europe during the during the Renaissance and sort of the, the early modern period, things like the Reformation, you know, wouldn't have been possible without this new technology of the printing press. Um, the Protestant reformers like Luther were, were uh, avid um, uh, sort of users of this technology. Um, Luther would, would have printed off for him pamphlets with his theological arguments um, that would, that, you know, could be distributed, uh, you know, in which he might be attacking the church and, uh, and could very quickly spread his ideas. And it was very hard for, say, the, the church to, to sort of suppress his works because, again, they could be printed off so quickly and distributed so, so rapidly and so, so cheaply as well. Um, and you really saw here the printing press enabled sort of the real birth of mass communication. It was a revolutionary thing, it's often referred to as the printing uh, revolution, you know, as revolutionary as, say, the, the birth of the internet uh, in our own age. Um, so let's move on to look at some examples from our collection. I wanted to kind of show you a comparison of a of a page, a leaf, um, like a disbound page from a manuscript uh, book and compare it to a printed book. So on the left we have a, um, this is a, a leaf from a, a, a work, um, a book about uh, canon law. Um, this is church law. And so um, this, this was scribed uh, in Italy, done by hand uh, in around the year 1300, probably in somewhere like Bologna, which was a famous, uh, had a famous university associated with, uh, with you know, training for the legal profession. Um, and if we just zoom into, you can see, you know, the, the text is very well done. Um, it is, yeah, it's done by a scribe in this, this very sort of classic uh, Gothic kind of scribal hand. Um, but yeah, this whole thing would have been written out by hand on, and this is parchment on like animal skin. Um, the leaf on the right is, uh, was printed about 150 years later, and this is in 1478 in Germany, in the city of Speyer. And, uh, you can see here, it's, it's the same, same type of text. It's, it's a work of canon law containing decretals. So these are kind of papal pronouncements on legal issues. Um, and if we zoom in too, you can see, if you compare the two types of text, very, very, very similar. And it shows you how the sort of traditional, I don't know, manuscript culture uh, continued to influence uh, printing even when it started. Um, even though they had this new technology that allowed them to do sort of new things with text, um, they still stuck to the old ways and, you know, sort of what was familiar for, for at least the opening kind of decades of, of print technology. Um, so you can see, yeah, they stuck with that, that gothic black letter uh, for, for quite a while. Other things too, um, I mean, the format of this page, uh, very similar to the, the uh, canon law book that was written by hand 150 years before. Um, also, they did things like um, uh, on this, this manuscript leaf, you can see in blue and red, they have paragraphs. These are kind of paragraph breaks. Um, you can see they continued with that tradition in the printed one. They've, they've printed these out. Uh, using red, and they've also printed um, these kind of illuminated initials or facsimiles of them um, in red ink uh, on this one as well. Again, you know, so many things that were present in medieval text kind of continued on in the print world, um, at least for, for the first little while. Even though, yeah, there's a lot of parts of even modern books that are very uh, uh, reminiscent of, of sort of medieval book uh, culture as well. Now, one thing, the printing press did not just allow for kind of the, you know, mass production and reproduction of text, but also images as well. So this, these are two leaves uh, from a really famous illust early illustrated work called the Nuremberg Chronicle. It was a history of the city of Nuremberg, uh, was found in southern Germany, and, uh, and here they have these fabulous woodcut illustrations um, that were printed um, yeah, that, that were printed using this technology. So you could use the printing press not only to print text, but also to print images. A big break from the medieval past where uh, if you wanted a book illustrated, you would have to hire an illuminator, a specialized book artist that would uh, paint, paint each um, picture uh, meticulously in by hand. Here you could have an artist uh, carve a, a wood, wood block 
um, into the scene and then use that to print off you know hundreds or thousands of copies of the same image um, until the block kind of wore out. So yeah, and, and the level of detail is pretty staggering. I love this, this scene. Um, it's supposed to be a city in Hungary. And on the other leaf here, we have uh, images of uh, a pope, a couple saints, and then at the bottom, a few uh, scurvy heretics. Um, one uh, an interesting thing about sort of those early decades of, of sort of printed book production was that for a long time, people kind of looked down on printed works as being inferior in, in sort of quality and, and just sort of being inferior in, in general kind of reputation um, to manuscript works. Um, so so they, they had sort of an interesting approach sometimes. Uh, this is a, we have a complete, um, this is a printed book of prayers that came, was printed in Paris in uh, the early 1520s. Um, and it is neat because yeah, it's printed. Uh, so all you know, the text here you see was was printed on a printing press. It wasn't done by hand. Um, but they really tried to make this book look like a manuscript in a lot of ways. So they painted in these these sort of gold borders. This would be done by an illuminator, that sort of book artist. And whoever owned this book or purchased it um, also had the illuminator actually paint this. This would have originally been like a, a woodcut illustration, a woodcut print. Um, but they've had the illuminator actually paint over it um, to make it look like, uh, I mean, it, it's, they basically transformed it into um, sort of a medieval style painted uh, miniature. Um, this one of the, the Adoration of the Magi. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting here. I, I think you're, you're seeing uh, a book at that very transitional period where, as I was saying, you know, print hasn't been fully kind of accepted culturally. Um, so, so here we have kind of a hybrid manuscript where um, it, it's printed, but it also has um, sort of hand done elements as well. So uh, this, uh, sorry, I didn't explain to you, the Book of Hours was sort of a personal devotional book um, meant for lay people, you know, ordinary non-clergy to uh, uh, sort of um, uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, say prayers and other kind of devotions to uh, focus on Mary and the saints. Um, so yeah, quite a, quite a neat book. Now, another thing that the printing press enabled was the spread of uh, the spread and sort of use of the vernacular. Um, the vernacular being sort of the common languages of Europe, uh, you know, not the, the lingua franca, the, the, uh, of, that was Latin. Um, you know, Latin in the medieval period was the language of, of uh, sort of, of education, of culture, of the church, um, and that was spoken by educated sort of across Europe. Um, and, and so with the, the printing press in the Renaissance, you saw a real rise in the production of works in, in not in Latin, but in sort of local vernacular. So, you know, uh, kind of Middle English, say, or, or Middle French, Middle German, Middle Italian, you know, kind of those, those sort of medieval languages. So the leaf that you see here is, is a, a fairly early um, uh, printed vernacular Bible, this one from 1477. Uh, printed in Germany, and if you you know zoom in on the text, you can see it is indeed in in German, um, sort of an archaic form of German, uh, not in this the traditional Latin. Um, this was a controversial thing. Uh, the idea that that you know the word of God could be translated into the the sort of the common tongue, um, and and there was a lot of uh, I don't know sort of reaction against this. Um, authorities in a lot of places in Europe actually cracked down on the production of vernacular Bibles, you know, destroying uh, destroying copies that were seized, um, arresting and imprisoning uh, printers that, that created these. Um, and this became really important too a little bit later in the context of the Reformation because, you know, the one of the, the big ideas that, that Luther and the other reformers had was, you know, um, this idea that everyone should be able to read the Word of God themselves, which meant that it needed to be in a language that the ordinary person could read in, in the vernacular and not in Latin, this language of educated elites. Um, so, so these became, uh, you know, vernacular Bibles like this became real kind of tools, uh, yeah, for, for the reformers a little bit later. I want to show you another example of a vernacular text. Uh, this one is a page from a 1507 um, edition of the uh, Dante's Inferno. Um, in Italian, so yeah, so again, not in not in uh, in Latin, but in in sort of the common language or what was becoming the common language of Italy. Um, the vernacular was kind of developing at this point. Um, so 
Yeah, and, and this is another thing with the printing press that really enabled um, the production of, of sort of different genres of books that hadn't been, you know, produced in great numbers uh, in sort of the medieval, uh, the, the medieval period um, when, when books were being created by hand. So like literature really took off in a big way, again, because there was a much bigger market. People could afford a copy of a book, um, like say this, you know, copy of Dante's Inferno, um, a much wider range of society could actually afford to have a printed copy, whereas a manuscript copy, you know, would be sort of exclusively expensive. Um, one, a couple of neat things to, to note about this one. One is just the text itself. Um, you can see it looks a lot more modern, I would say, uh, and very different than that sort of chunky, hard to read Gothic black letter that we were looking at a little bit earlier. And this is, this is a sort of a humanist uh, font. Um, this one, humanist scholars in Italy and other places, you know, they were always kind of looking back to to the to classical antiquity, and one thing that that they did was uh, was sort of look back and try to recreate some of the um, what they figured were scribal hands used in in ancient Rome, um, and then sort of based fonts on that. So this is supposed to be kind of a recreation of that ancient Roman style of writing. Um, much easier to read, and you can see, you know, very influential because that's that's what all of our books now look like. Um, the the black letter stuck on in parts of Europe for quite a long time. In Germany, right up to the 20th century, they were still using it fairly commonly. Um, but now, yeah, you can see these humanist hands have completely won out one of many legacies of the Renaissance. Uh, another kind of neat thing is just these these sort of delightful uh, woodcut illustrations. Um, here we have kind of an illuminated initial, and here we have, this is uh, Dante with the D above his head, uh, accompanied by Virgil with the V, um, nicely identified for us. And you can see they're gazing at, you know, they're, they're transcending through the, um, the circles of hell. Here they see sinners, these are, these are like uh, corrupt politicians um, that are being forced as their punishment for all eternity to swim in a, a lake of boiling pitch. And if they try to get out, uh, they're attacked by these horrendous uh, demons. So again, showing that that ability with the printing press where you can pair sort of text and image together um, and fairly economically. Now another, uh, just, just sticking with uh, kind of um, uh, Renaissance uh, scholarship, humanist scholarship, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, um, sort of how the printing press enabled, uh, yeah, humanist scholarship. So this is this is a great example of that. This one uh, comes from Venice, which was a real center of, of printing um, in in Italy during the Renaissance. Uh, this was printed in 1497. This is part of the complete the first time that the the complete works of Aristotle were were printed um, in in the original Greek. Um, this comes from a very very famous printer known as Aldus Manutius. Uh, who was yeah, quite an innovator, a humanist scholar himself. Uh, like a lot of his, his uh, scholarly brethren, um, he saw it as really essential um, that, that you know, scholars uh, be able to access the sort of original um, sources of, of you know, these works of, of classical antiquity um, in their original languages. So you know, he was quite an innovator because it was super hard to uh, reproduce. This is in, in, you know, so this is the works of Aristotle, his philosophy in the original Greek, um, which was very hard to reproduce with the printing press of the time. They had to create, you know, a whole new sort of typeset uh, just to do this. And, and uh, but, but, you know, having created this, it really allowed for Aristotle's works, which, you know, previously you know, had been only, uh, or very hard to kind of get your hands on because, you know, it only existed a certain number of manuscript copies. A lot of them say that had come from, uh, the Byzantine empire after its collapse. Uh, suddenly, you know, with, with all this, uh, printing these, um, scholars across Europe could get their hands on these texts in the original languages for study. So yeah, a huge, huge kind of breakthrough. Um, his stuff was held up as, as some of the, um, the best printing of its day, and yeah, still it's, it's really sought after by, by collectors. One last classical text that I want to show you here. Uh, this is a, um, I believe this one's from yeah, early 16th century. Uh, this is, uh, this one's in Latin, not in, not in uh, original kind of language. Um, but this is uh, Virgil's Aeneid. Uh, I, sorry, I guess when I said original, it would have been in Latin originally. So maybe this is the original uh, text. Um, because Virgil, of course, uh, uh, 
you know, ancient Roman poet. Um, the Aeneid tracks uh, the sort of voyages of Aeneas, um, a Trojan nobleman who escapes from, from his uh, city after, you know, after its fall to the Greeks, goes on a bunch of big voyages around the, the Mediterranean, and then ends up uh, in Italy where he founds the city of Rome, according to Roman mythology. Um, the, the nice thing about this is it has this huge and wonderful uh, illustration you can see here, done in, and I would say this is a very kind of late medieval rather than renaissance style. Um, you can see, uh, very typical of, of the time, all the figures uh, are depicted in, in sort of contemporary clothes, not in, you know, they're not dressed as we would think of, of sort of ancient Romans, but dressed as, you know, medieval sort of noblemen. Um, and we have this very uh, medieval city kind of behind it, you know, very typical of how they would uh, depict these these classical scenes in sort of yeah medieval uh, getup. So yeah, just another nice example of again kind of Renaissance efforts to kind of resurrect and preserve um, the the literature of the ancient world um, through by through through uh, the printing press. So all right, and that brings us to the end. Uh, it was. Um, uh, if you did want to take a look at, at more of this collection, we have all the, these examples I've shown you come from the Mount Royal Archives early print collection, which basically showcases uh, uh, the modest examples of printing from the 1470s right up to the end of the 16, or sorry, the 1500s. Um, so if you want to take a look at it, you can go to our, our uh, database, that's at archives.mtroyal.ca, and you can search for the early print collection. Um, you can there view and download high resolution scans of just about everything in the collection, all the leaves that I showed you. Um, and as I said, we do have a couple complete works as well. And in ordinary times, once we get through this horrible pandemic, uh, you know, you can also come in and take a look at this stuff in person. It is publicly accessible. If you have questions, you can email me at phouston at mtrl.ca. And uh, if not, uh, thanks for watching.